Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes, I work at uh, Moscow Institute of, of Physics and Technology. It was one of the most prominent uh, technical universities in Russia. And my background is particle physics in Institute of Nuclear Research in Russia. And now we have our own laboratory, nuclear physics methods, and we, I am a team lead at this uh, new JetBrains research laboratory. For uh, JetBrains research is not widely known right now, but it's a enterprise uh, created by JetBrains company, which you are probably familiar with. Uh, which supports different scientific endeavors in different fields, including computer science, uh, biology, uh, robotic techniques, and now physics as well. So we are part of it. And uh, I've been doing a software uh, development in science, uh, neutrino physics, for the last uh, 15 years, probably. And the uh, last three years, I'm doing it in Kotlin. So today I'm going to talk to you about Kotlin and what is the state of Kotlin ecosystem for science? Why do we need something new in science in terms of computer language? And uh, what, is the pros what are the prospects of, of all that? And of course, please ask your questions if you have any. Uh, I will uh, try to answer them to the best of my capability. So, yeah. uh, uh, so why why science is different? Why science requires some specific tools, and uh, how it is different from I don't know web development or systems programming or whatever else. Uh, first of all, we have very big toys like army and probably uh here in this picture you see a super kamiokando experiment it's a huge uh underground neutrino detector in japan and it's a uh, like 40 by 40 meters uh kilometer underground with ultra pure water and uh, a lot of very expensive very specific very unique Photomultipliers, and you can see that people were walking inside this experiment. So it's huge. And the super Kamiokande is not only a uh, case, for example, there we, you probably, you, there are huge setups closer to you. For example, you probably know in Geneva, there is a large Hadron Collider and there are telescopes and uh, space stations. So, and we have very large uh, tools to work with. Uh, Science is still probably the most, uh, the largest source of data in our world. Because, for example, if you take data from Large Hadron Collider, it's like gigabytes per second when, when it is running. So it's, when you uh, tell that a big data is something you can put into your Excel table, it's not a big data. Big data is when you can put it on the single machine or even tens of different computers and analyze at once and you have to invent something new to work with all that uh big distances here here you see additional uh, another one experiment again from particle physics this is my background it's actually on the soft pole it's called ice cube experiment and it's also about neutrinos it's inside the soft pole not on the soft pole inside it's a kilometer ice cube inside the ice of antarctica and so we need tools to communicate with uh, all, all those distances to pass data etc et uh, the experiments not only in particle physics but in general in science span tens of years of course it's extreme but at least uh, several years so we need our software to be stable and to be maintainable not by a single people but different people with a different background for a lot of time and it's very important and it's uh, probably the main problem right now in, in uh, scientific software and of course <laughs> fundamental science is never paid quite well so uh, the problem is that you can't invite super duper qualified programmers 
to create and maintain your software. So you need something simple that even people without a specific qualification in the software design, software engineering to work uh, with all that. So in order to solve all these problems, you need a tool, a language and ecosystem. Uh, language is not quite important, actually. Is that what, what is important is ecosystem, tooling, etc. You need a tooling to do to be flexible, fast, and uh, easy to use without bugs, without problems. And uh, we all we need all that in one uh, package. So let's discuss uh, some languages uh, what we have now and some some tools what we, we already have and. Please excuse me if I touch some, some sensibilities because it's my, only my opinion in this case. Uh, of course, we have, have history here as a C port one. And yes, it's okay, but uh, it requires too much work to create uh, complex programs in C port one. And uh, of course, you can use them for hardware, for embedded software, but uh, doing something like analysis framework and C is exhausting. C++ is, uh, at least in particle physics, it's a primary language right now because uh, historically, because historically, and Scala is quite different language. Probably you know about it. It's a dialect. It's a one of GVM languages, but they have the same problem. They too expensive in terms of development. So you have uh, they complex. So you have to hire very highly qualif qualified specialists to do proper code in C++ or Scala. And if you do not hire high, highly qualified specialists, you will have a, let us call it bad code. And we'll not have a lot of this bad code in C++ right now. And it's, this is problem. This actually a bunch of problems because you can't invite new people to work with it because it's nasty. It's just not pleasant to work with. I'm not saying that you can't write, write good code in C++. I'm just, just saying it requires a lot of expertise to do that. Python uh, is maybe your primary language right now because it allows easy interoperability with a C, C++, or even some in some cases, uh, a C part one, and in some cases, C++ libraries. But, uh, and it's easy, and it's quite easy to write programs. but. Python is quite limited uh, to uh, glue language task. So if you are gluing some existing code, uh, it's, it's fine, it's perfectly okay. And we are teaching Python for non-programmers physicists at MIPT. But uh, as soon as you want to do something new, you find you can do it. You, you have to rely on very limited subset of Python. It's NumPy and even subset of NumPy to uh, make it work fast. And uh, you do not have a proper type system and you do not have proper reliable build system. So maintaining large product project in Python is a pain in the end. So uh, if you are just user, it's okay. But if you're a developer, it's very hard to do this. Java is was actually my favorite language for last 10 year for for 10 years when I have started to work and it's still a very nice language and it's very stable and it, it has perfect ecosystem like build tools repositories uh, debugging tools uh, profiling tools uh, uh, IDEs but uh, Java is also old language it's not as old as Python or C++ but it's still old and uh, so we need something more modern right now in from the language point of view. Of course, we have some uh, other language like Haskell uh, and uh, Haskell have, do you know a lot of people writing in Haskell? Uh, I know one guy writing in Haskell and he's, oh, you're writing in Haskell, okay. Uh, uh, I, ha I know one, another guy now well, you know a second one <laughs> actually not at the moment anymore i also switched to kotlin <laughs> okay uh ha haskell is a interesting thing but uh, you will never find people to write in haskell and even if you find you will need to teach on like four or five years first yeah uh, so, so they could do it properly 
it's nice, but it's not practical. A well, you need, you need oh. a computer science PhD for it, right? We used it a while ago. Uh, in a... <laughs> probably no, because uh, my friend Alexei Hudikov, who is, oh, he was learning with me in, in the same group. So he's particle physicist. He is mastered it without PhD. But yes, yes, it, it requires a lot of time to dive in. Rust was actually one of the uh, my primary choices when I uh, start searching something beyond Java. And it's still very interesting uh, choice because it allows uh, easy access, more or less easy access to low level functionality if you need to uh, drive for performance uh, and uh, interoperability with the C and Fortran as well. But still, it's hard and probably uh, you won't find a lot of uh, physicists or scientists who could learn it properly and work with it. Uh, of course, I haven't mentioned Julia here. Uh, it's an old presentation, uh, old slide. And Julia is probably my second best choice right now because it's a nice language. It's modern and has a, a lot of things. Um, and it's a good choice as a better Python. Uh, but uh, there are, of course, uh, there are also some limitations, for example, uh, libraries, uh, there are problems with tooling uh, and uh, all that, and the uh, type system is optional. So you should look at, at Julia, but it's not my primary choice. So you obviously guessed what, what I'm coming to, I'm coming to Kotlin. And why is Kotlin is, uh, in my opinion, one of the best, or well, maybe the best candidate for language for science. It has, uh, uh, it is, has fully compatibility with the Java ecosystem. So all libraries, all those numerous libraries in Java ecosystem, you can use without any uh, problem. You just call it. You don't need anything else. You just code the Java code from Kotlin, and it's working perfectly fine. And uh, most of the tools developed for Java ecosystems, like IDs, like profilers, debuggers, etc., they work perfectly well with Kotlin. So you can take all the best things from Java ecosystem and uh, uh, do not use Java and use a more modern language. It's, it's a tremendous thing. Uh, scope functions, I probably will show you later how it works. Scope functions and extensions is a very important language feature in Kotlin, which allows us to define uh, new behaviors for types we already have without monkey patching them. You probably, do you know what what monkey patching is? Somebody know what, what monkey patching is? I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, consider Python. You have an object uh, and it has defined behaviors, and then you say uh let's add a function to this object and it will have new behavior and this object will be patched uh it you can do the same in uh, say javascript or in groovy and this is called monkey patching and it is considered a very bad practice because the reliability of this code uh, is bad uh, you see this code will work differently before the patching and after patching. And if you're, for example, working in the notebook environment and you switch cells, the sw switch the order of cell execution, you will have completely different results. So this is a problem and Kotlin allows this uh, to solve uh, the problem of extensibility in the static uh, type safe way. Coroutines is a very important thing. I'm not sure I will have time to properly show it today, but uh, coroutines are a very, maybe the most modern framework for asynchronous computations and asynchronous computations are everywhere. So uh, we have to rely on them. And uh, Kotlin has very nice uh, both language level support and uh, and uh, library level support for synchronous computations. And uh, other languages are now starting to copy uh, some principles from Kotlin. Okay. 
Uh, Multi-platform is a rather experimental thing. Uh, I've said before that Kotlin is based on GVM and based on Java, but, but actually right now we have not only Kotlin GVM, we have also Kotlin JS, Kotlin native, and in recent in the future we'll have Kotlin WebAssembly as well. It means that uh, you can write a common code and share it between, for example, browser target, which is very important, for example, for visualization right now, all the visualization in browser, and I will show some examples. And um, uh, backend, and also we will we are able to interact with the native libraries, for example, on C, uh, writing code in much more uh, modern Kotlin. Uh, native part is still very experimental, but uh, the JavaScript part and uh, is working perfectly well right now. Uh, and of course, uh, some someone have to pay for all that. So the industrial support from JetBrains is very important because it's like a hundred people working permanently on this compiler IDs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a tremendous amount of money uh, put into development of, of this tooling, and it really makes a difference. Uh, some examples here. It's uh, uh, one of our oldest projects, like three or four years ago. It's a simulation. I probably will be able to just run the new version of the same simulation today and show you. I forgot to start it, but I will do. Uh, uh, it's a detector, underground detector, muon monitor. It was tested in a subterranean laboratory in Confront. Uh, be between the Spain and France, and it is a kilometer underground. It's a lot of scintillator tiles, and it, it is used to measure the differential uh, flux of muons deep underground to to understand both how different experiment in the same uh, area will work, and uh, to understand uh, it could be. All, we, we are now will use the same approach to uh, geological uh, studies and we will find some uh, ore. Well, we'll try to find some ore and also it could be used to ecological monitoring of uh, structures in the oil uh, industry. So uh, uh, I have initially had a Java code, Java code and a Java FX. I use Java FX for visualization. Hmm? Oh, okay. And uh, uh, after rewriting it is in Kotlin, it works the same, uh, uh, but it's much uh, nicer to look at and uh, much less code, which is not probably very. Uh, uh, Great, it, it's not a great achievement, but it's still very nice to do. Uh, right now, uh, we are rewritten all that uh, visualization part into web, so we can now make all these visualizations remotely. The, my own background is Stroisk new mass experiment. It's a search for neutrinos, I mean, uh, mass of electron neutrinos and uh, mm, sterile neutrinos. And there was a, a lot of work done in Kotlin in this case. We've, we've uh, done the whole analysis framework in Kotlin, and it's a very complicated analysis. The analysis itself is one of the most complicated thing in particle physics, I mean, for those in Trinos. And there are asynchronous framework for parallel and for automatic parallel analysis and all a lot of features, and it's used still. And we also implemented all the uh hardware control systems in Kotlin as well so we need to communicate with devices via different interfaces uh we need to do storage files uh, data storage uh, it's uh, not uh, so much data it's like several terabytes of data it's, it's, it's still large but not not probably like accelerator scale large and 
what is important here is it's a huge project like uh, tens of thousands lines of code and it takes only one guy to maintain it it's very important because usually with a such a uh, large scale code you need a large team just to make it work continuously so uh, safety uh, better language features uh, and uh, core teams make it work and what, what was important for me at this moment that's uh, parts of the framework were written in java so i can mix kotlin and java in one in one project so i can gradually switch uh, from one language to another okay uh, i probably forget to update this example but let me show it uh, mathematics mathematics for last two years we were working on mathematics and um, we want to do some math. What should we use? And we have some uh, possibilities. And we have uh, old tools, GNU math. Do, do anyone use GNU math, GNU mathematical tools right now, or only in Python? Probably only by Python. R, probably also only in statistics, NumPy, Julia. There are a lot, lot of possibilities. Uh, uh, but uh, Developing something new is hard. Uh, probably, except Julia, you, you can do new, new, new things in Julia because it has fast compilation. But if you take something like NumPy, R, or any C based libraries, in order to add something new, you need to go to the C code uh, and implement something new in C, and then create a wrapper in a more convenient language. And then you need to create a build which will compile this native code for different platforms and deploy it to user. It's a pain in different places. And uh, what what uh, my friend Oliver Schulz calls it, it's a, he is actually a Julia enthusiast. Uh, he calls it a two language problem. So in order to make something work uh, good in Python, you need to write something good in C. And this is a problem, yes. Uh, and for that, you need some kind of language which will uh, be flexible and allow you to make fast code simultaneously. So we, uh, it was the first motivation to create this KMath library. And we uh, immediately we created not only GVM library, we started to do it multi-platform. So you can go to the repository and see the features we have right now. Uh, but we also, um, used uh, Kotlin features to the maximum here because you probably know uh, when you do some computations it is a common problem to compute for example sum of two numbers let's say one of them is integer and one of them is complex how you should compute your sum or even worse one of them is vector and one of them is number you, of course, you can create implicit rules like, like in Python, Python to sum all those things. And uh, you know that you, when you add a number to a vector, you will uh, add this number element wise to all these vectors, ve vector uh, uh, content. Uh, but it creates a lot of problems here. Julia have a solution with uh, this uh, explicit broadcasting dot operator, but it is still a problem, and it becomes even more problem if you have uh, more sophisticated structures, like for example, uh, vector of vectors, like that. You can't create smart implicit rules for that. You you can, but you will uh, you will have problems with that. In KMath, we are using this context-oriented programming, I meaning that uh, we create a context. For example, this, this result uh, is computed in the uh, n-dimensional field of complex values, uh, of complex vectors of the size 8. And we know that any operations inside will, will be done in this. In this. this is actually a language feature in probably not one easy to understand because this object here is a scope and 
in this scope, there are new methods available to uh, already existing objects. For example, there are no plus operation on the complex at all. It's not defined. But inside this scope, you can add them. Outside the scope, you will get compilation error and you, get, you won't get any, uh, uh, any there. But inside the scope, it will work. Maybe if you're interested, I can show you uh, uh, more examples later. Uh, what is really important and what, what I've missed a lot uh, when we tried to work in Java, it are the visualization tools. And in Python, you have nice libraries like uh, NumPy, uh, Matplotlib is not quite nice, but it's working. But I have a Plotly library and uh, all others, and it's quite easy to visualize uh, the data. Of course, it, uh, sometimes it requires some random key pressing to understand how it works because you do not have types. For example, if you ever used Plotly in Python, you can't use it without uh, documentation because you need to check with the documentation how to do this or that. Um, Alexander, sorry, a short question about Plotly. Um, so what's your what's the output here? Does this go like is this like intended for browser or or where do the where do the produced images go? Yes, uh, Plotly is a JavaScript library. Plotly itself is a JavaScript library. So of course uh, you can produce uh, images only in uh, JavaScript in browser, but it's quite easy to do, and we've actually done it. And again, if you're interested, I can show you examples later, or you can just go to this repository and uh, try examples yourself uh, to create a standalone HTML file from uh, this library. It means it means that it will be perfectly all your visualization, all your other information as well will be stored there, and it will be self-contained. Uh, HTML file. I'm not sure what this circle means. Okay. Uh, and what is important here is that we are doing it in a type safe way. Uh, I, I will show an example later. Uh, Plotly kit is actually more complicated thing because it allows things that are not available in Python. Uh, for example, it allows dynamic updates of the plot. Uh, usually you just create this JSON object to plot the use inside and uh, you just display it. But in our cases, since we have all this nice uh, Java and Kotlin web stack machinery, we can use the dynamic updates to the plots. Uh, and uh, of course the uh, multi-platform nature helps us as well because we can, oh, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, Yeah, I should just download it. Okay, uh, let me let me uh, share it, uh, not from browser. A moment, please. I just started it uh, in browser uh, because I wanted to switch to uh, notebook uh, easier, but. There are some problems, I'm sure. Think. Uh, think. Yeah, okay. Let me skip to this point. Uh, we can, since we are sharing the model, I mean the visualization model, it's not necessary to plot the model, the same could be applied to different visualization tools. Since we share them uh, between the back end and the front end, it's quite easy to implement all that without a lot of people working on this project. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's all, all about the same thing that we are actually using coordinates to the maximum extent and we can actually do uh, real time updates with the plot like it because we do not have to recreate the whole data model on the web, uh, on the client side. Each time we update something, we can create an aggregator and I've tested it's uh, down to times like milliseconds. I mean, in the, uh, 
distance between updates and it works perfectly fine. The next step we've taken last year is not only to take the libraries we already have, but also uh, go to other technologies available on the web and I mean, the browser. And uh, that's a project called Vision Forge, and we initially started to work on it for so-called event display. In particle physics, I mean, mostly in accelerator physics, you know, when one particle hits another with a lot of energy, you have a lot of a lot of different uh, other particles and they just hit different detectors. You have all these nice pictures from LHC when it's, everything shines. And it's, uh, they say, yeah, yeah, this is science, a lot, a lot of shiny pictures. And for that, you need tooling. Current tooling uh, used by accelerator physics uh, is based on CERN root mostly. So it's a C++, it's a desktop and uh, it's pretty old and it's very hard to develop. Uh, it's, uh, they did not introduce anything principally new to this framework for like 10 years. And it's very hard to do it, we, we've tried. There is a GS root framework which allows uh, doing the same in browser, but it's still probably no one, but it's a single developer can do something about it. Here we have uh, some principle in you, the, the fine structured uh, model representation. And we are using quite modern libraries for web visualization, namely a 3JS library. And uh, there are a lot of additional features since we have this data model, we can transform, optimize models, or even we've not implemented it right now, but we can even uh, do physical physics works. For example, we can find intersections of volume. When you do visualization, when you do simulations, when you design the geometry for Monte Carlo simulation particle physics, you uh, need, it's very important work because all the particle physics is based on simulation. You need to know, for example, if those volumes will intersect. And it is possible, also possible to do, uh, not now, but, but in future, we will add this feature as well. Uh, again, I'm probably won't go into a lot of details right now. Maybe when we uh, go to demonstration, we can discuss it, but we probably won't have time for that. Uh, a lot of features here like temp uh, templates, so like caching volumes to optimize. And uh, it's written here is like 400,000 objects displayed. It's uh, it's very large number even for computer games and for fully uh, customizable objects. It's a tremendous amount. The project I'm working right now uh, very intensively is the device control systems. And we are working with the uh, uh, guys from DAISY and from guys from Novosibirsk. And uh, the primary application right now is IAXO experiment. It's an Axion search. And uh, I'm not sure if you work a lot with the hardware, but you probably know that so working with the hardware is uh, complicated from the software fine point of view, because uh, on the ground level, when you have the systems programs and drivers, they are good, they're fine, they're working. But when you try to use the software, uh, which was shipped with all those hardware, like pressure sensors or whatever, you find you need to toss it out and write it from the scratch yourself because otherwise it's unusable. It's used some kind of proprietary platform or it's not integrating with the different vendors and uh, all that. There are so-called SCADA or control systems like uh, Tango controls, Dukes controls and other systems, uh, mostly like 15 or 20 years old, all of them. And they allow more or less to solve this problem, but still creating uh, this device server. It's not driver, device server, it's a little bit different. For new equipment is a very daunting task. And it's, oh, again, it's most, in most cases it's in C++ and that requires, even with my expertise, uh, understanding how to write a device server in Dukes took like half a year. Uh, so for new people, it could be years to even understand how do things properly. 
and uh, the idea is to create new um, asynchronous fully asynchronous uh, de device servers and make them communicate with uh, control systems using uh, modern approaches like reactive streams for example and we are doing it right now the first results are already available and of course those things won't be available if we uh, would be using well, something like c or c plus plus try to write a synchronous program in c plus plus it's a complicated thing yeah uh, and uh, again it's a slide about device control and it allows actually the design allows a lot of things for example you it's based on microservice architecture and it allows to uh, add things like analyzer software inside your control system for example you are reading the data from the sensor and then you put an additional service which will get the data on the fly analyze it like neural network or what, any fun, fancy thing you like and in real time it will with a small delay of course it will produce the results for user you do not need to create uh, something on the user side uh, or on the device side you just need to plug this service inside your network and it's it's uh, really amazing what, what new capabilities we will have there but it, again it requires a very good uh, network inf infrastructure and it requires a synchronous programming to do just that uh simulations uh, is a this additional thing and we have a lot of those uh, in particle physics all is based on the simulations and uh, there are some nice new ideas uh, if we do not have to think a lot about how to organize those computations and the language and the gvm saves so that for us we can save time and work a little bit more about how can we do it better for example all uh, most almost all or i can say all uh, modern simulation frameworks are single thread just because they are designed this way and uh, there are no nice and cheap ways to make them parallel and they're probably not only in physics they run multiple simulations in parallel in order to achieve uh, Feel the, all the processing power in modern computers. So now we can. What we can do is to design the simulation framework, which can do things in parallel and can work uh, yeah, even and even in distributed way. I'm not sure I placed this link here. No, I forgot to place the link. Uh, maybe I will place it later. Uh, we've published a preprint preprint uh, recently about uh, terrestrial gamma flash simulation and it uh, uses this parallel approach and uh, it's like uh, millions of mi mi millions of particles in uh, several seconds so you can achieve a lot of things with this approach but again it needs uh, good tooling because you can't rely on programs written in the C they are not parallelizable in principle so good tooling and uh, good language and uh, nice things data science wow. probably a lot of you are about data science i'm not doing data science uh, and i personally do not believe that data science have anything to do with data and science uh, i'm a, i'm a specialist in uh, analysis uh, and I'm doing lectures on uh, mathematical statistics, so I do not really believe in data science, but still uh, the worlds are around and a lot of money inside it. And the common consensus uh, from people I've been talking with is that Kotlin is great for data science because it's a modern, concise, uh, a lot of tools from Java ecosystems and it's a JIT, it's a super fast compared to even native implementations. So if you do not have a super optimized native things like BLAS, then the simple uh, GVM program will be probably running faster. And 
yeah and it's simple and uh, so what what one needs to make it the first uh, citizen for data science is a tooling and since uh, last year there is a team at JetBrains called Kotlin for Data or Kotlin for Data Science team and they are working and doing a lot of things I'll go to this link and see the new things or they have created the Kotlin Jupyter kernel, which I will show you today. Uh, some visualization tools. Uh, Let's plot is a very nice library. It's uh, uh, right now it's probably on par with our own uh, plot the kit, uh, but uh, it has a benefit that it's a hundred percent Kotlin, so it's, it doesn't rely on JavaScript uh, for that. Right now, I do not use it because it use right now it use these grammar or graphics uh, design from R, which I do not like. But the library itself is exciting. Now they published uh, Spark, Apache Spark. Uh, do you know what Spark is? Probably you know what Spark is. Um, Apache Spark buddings for Kotlin and its developer, developer Pasha Simplestein, uh, who worked a lot in uh, data engineering and the uh, Spark, and he says in some regards it's even better than the initial uh, Scala design for this. So people are very excited about it. I do not use it, so I can tell. And a lot of other things. For example, I will show you today uh, partially the not yet fully released package called data frame which imitates which follows the principles from uh, pandas library and a lot of other things okay that's uh, the end of my not so short presentation uh, if you have any uh, questions you can ask uh, wherever you like and of course uh, Ah, it's a Telegram community. It's, it's mostly in Russian, so they, they support English. I should, should probably cross out, but but there is a Kotlin Slack when you can ask any question. And there is a mistake here because this in should not be here. Okay, but you will find it, or you can ask me. Now, uh, while I'm switching to the different window, you can ask any questions, uh, any general questions. Um, what if it's another general but more specific question? Okay. <laughs> so I'm actually interested in your in your synchronization code. So we have developed here a uh, a visualization framework for for systems biology we're mainly concerned with like large volumetric data and rendering but on also on distributed systems like cave power wall and so on and uh so it's actually not a question you have to answer right now but i would be i would be uh, very much interested in having uh, you know some kind of idea exchange about how how you handle like your your tree synchronization in in your plot library for example and what we could maybe learn from that yes uh, actually uh you probably can use uh, some some things because uh, there is a, this open source uh, vision forge library which incorporates mm -hmm. all the experience from plotly and it, it allows it's modular so it allows uh, to uh, i'm just trying to run it uh, can you can you remind me of the url again somewhere somewhere uh, on github right uh, okay I, I can or maybe post uh, it in the chat or something. Yeah, a moment, please. I'm trying to understand which which uh, which page I am sharing. Uh, a moment, please. <laughs> I'm trying to understand. <laughs> uh, okay, I wanted to share the tab, not. Um, okay, let me let me share share the uh, whole uh, Chrome, and you you can probably see my tabs right now. So it's a. Uh, Vision Forge, and uh, here it is. Uh, the documentation okay, cool. is a little bit outdated. 
but it allows it already have all the uh, primitive things you need for uh, visualization uh, like spheres and uh, all primitives and configuration tools cool okay thank you also your your math library looks looks very exciting I'm curious uh, yes it's it it still it still lacks uh, it still lacks uh, uh, proper um, documentation Okay, I'm not sure. Again, I'm not sure which which screen I'm sharing. I wanted to show, uh, not the not the screen, but aha. Uh -huh, okay. Sounds. Something, sometimes it's hard to understand Zoom. Okay, uh, let's start with a simple demonstration. The thing you, if you ever want to try cotton. The thing you will probably uh, complain a lot about is the build system, because build system is, in my opinion, is one of the most great. Uh, it's the greatest thing in the GVM eco ecosystem. I mean, the Gradle or Maven Gradle now mostly. Uh, it says you how what libraries uh, you want to use automatically downloads them and combines them all into the application or a library. Uh, it uh, provides a reliability and uh, stability and you can reproduce your results and it's very important but on the other hand it requires some time like several days to study it and people coming from python complaining a lot about it so so this is hard i just can't hit that pip install and it will work you need to learn it because it's very important but uh, just to start it we will bypass it today and I will just start from the, this nice Jupyter kernel, and you can install it yourself uh, via Kotlin Jupyter. And here is a project. And you can see installed instructions like, in, like Python people like. So just install it and it will work. You do not need anything else. You do not need to set up local repository or virtual environments or whatever. So let us start. I use a predefined imports here. Uh, they are predefined, but I also can use imports from uh, any repository, any uh, Maven or Ivy repositories as well. So I'm starting. Uh, it takes some time because I'm loading the dependency and it's uh, embedding it into. Yeah. And here is our first plot. Here it is. It's a uh, plotly plot. I, I'm using it here, and it creates a scatter with a several uh, points. And what is important here is that I can customize it in a type safe way. Let's start uh, just typing layout and. Uh, what's happening with autocomplete autocompleted here yes uh layout and it helps me that their uh, uh layout uh, scope and in layout scope i can for example search for axis customization uh let's start with x x axis yes there is an x axis uh block here we can use and we can for example uh search if we have customized sticks. I don't remember the plot the API by hand, by, by, by heart. So I need to rely to documentation. In this case, I do not have to because I just start to type it and it says uh, that tick mode, uh, probably something like this. Uh, and uh, No, I do not see. Ah, here it, here it is. So uh, I can like this. Probably auto is what it does by default. So I need to like, uh, I don't think anything changed here because it's by default. But, but, but I can do things, other things like, for example, uh, mode. Oops. I don't remember how to do a logarithmic scale, but okay. 
I, I want to ask a question. So how does the hint work? Is it automatic or do I need to load something? Uh, it's automatic. Uh, the thing is that uh, the Kotlin is a statically typed language. So when I do uh, this magic here, what I exactly do, I am trying to call uh, the uh, methods of this object. Let me share, show you. Uh, let me write these here. And here I will here have all those methods available inside this code. And we can actually do more, and we can do uh, print this object. If I would be in ID, I, I will just control click inside and see. But, but since I'm in notebook, it's not this easy. But we can see that this object inside here is so is the access object. So when I'm modifying something inside this scope, as I said, scopes are important to Kotlin. I'm working on this scope object for uh, this block and this is access and we can actually do a little bit more um, let me I, i'm on. asking this question because i'm repeating what you're doing i quickly installed Kotlin, but it seems the hint does not work for me it's just uh, i'm wondering what went wrong here oh, <laughs> you, well, there, yeah. there, could, there, could, there could be different things maybe maybe i uh, see uh, some bug uh, here. I I'm using I'm using the stable version, so it should should be probably use or work for you as well. Uh, I, I I I probably can't can bug fix right now, but uh, mostly it's work. I do not like actually do not like to work in Jupyter. I'm showing you to Jupyter just for uh, simplicity. So. Uh, let me demonstrate this scope thing a little bit more and let us extract this uh, trace I created here to a site. We define the new variable var trace. trace. I, in, in Kotlin, I have to uh, define types, otherwise, it won't work. It's not Python. So I've just defined a object called trace uh, with a type trace and uh, this question mark means it's a nullable in Kotlin you control nullability I mean uh, you have a null types that could be null and that could not be null and then I just say trace yeah it, it's exactly the same but then the difference comes so let let us do something like this trace uh, X uh, uh, yeah, the picture sh shift. you see that, yeah. So we actually uh, uh, can change the plot uh, after it's created. You can modify it. And we can do even uh, nicer things. Let me do it just this. Uh, let us do like, uh, okay. Uh, uh, we can keep it as it is. And then uh, let us define Y as Uh, those those things are just a type safe accessor, so I can on, not only put values here, but assign them to. Uh, let's map this map them to double. I am just creating. Uh, uh, numbers from. Uh, from one to two the, in the uh, small bits. And here, let us say uh, x numbers map uh, uh, h probably. Uh, Yeah, 
here we have a, a sign here and we can probably even make it more beautiful by so that's simple uh i know that uh it uh really makes me mad when i have to do those things in python because i do not have those ma mapping functions and lambdas and i have to do with a collection comprehension which i never comprehend properly so nice uh let now let me show you a demonstration if if it works properly let me show you the demonstration of asynchronous things uh, we need probably we will probably need to add import but okay And now, uh, let me do it this way. Mm. We will create, we will modify the uh, Y value to shift it by some amount of time. Uh, Uh, we will need to introduce some kind of time variable. Um, and then we need to just copy this here, and we will just add the um, uh, time offset to or uh, to x coordinate so it will be it plus t uh, we need to divide it by some value so it would be on the fast probably won't compile because i do not have uh proper imports for coroutines and now it should probably work uh Ah yes, yes, of course. I, I I need I need to do it inside the trace object. I can add. I can uh, do the same by adding uh, oh yeah, it started to work, probably too fast. I'm catching in job and I will launch it again with uh, some kind of uh, larger delay. Uh, probably too much, st still too much here. And I need to reset it. No, uh, still too large uh, time scale. But you, but you see, but you see the idea. I'm creating an asynchronous task justice in, inside this Jupyter, and it, it updates the data when, when I want it. Ah, and of course, I, I again I see the problem here because I need to bypass the automatic. Type coercion. No, still, still some kind of problem. But you see, it's working. Okay. Uh, now for data manipulation, and this is something new for me. This is not I usually do in my work. Is it is uh, the uh, working with tables, and this there is this nice data frame library and everyone i see that every data science work is with this iris diagram iris data, data set so i'm taking it just from the git github and i load it and it's perfectly displayed in this uh, jupyter table the same way the pandas table is and then i can do the same things i do 
in uh, pandas, but again, in a type safe way. So I can add a column here and it works perfectly fine. But it's actually better than in Python because I can do it in a type safe way. I can check what properties are available here. Uh, here, some a little bit of magic involved in this because uh, you, you can't get the type safe uh, column dimensions before you read the file. But again, I probably won't go in detail. What is important is that it uh, uses that, and then we can call this new col column. Oops. Uh, they are immutable, so I need to do this this way. So you can call it by its name, like you're doing it in uh, Pandas, uh, like do it in Python. Doing things like that in static type language is a magic, but it's not very complicated magic in this case. Okay. Now uh, to the second example. I'm not sure why it does not cancel. Some kind of bug in the code. I, I will need to fix it later. Uh, Another thing I want to show you today is that actually it's a Vision Forge, and now I do not use a predefined library. I just define where this uh, repository is located, and I define the fully qualified uh, path to the library, and it works pretty well. And it's created, and then I'm defining the geometry. Here I use a GDML format. GDML was designed for giant three and then gen four, so, so it's a certain uh, standard for uh, XML-based geometry. And here I use only several lines of code. In GDML, it will be like uh, hundreds of code, lines of code, in, even in XML. And of course, if we see the C++ implementation, it will be even larger. And here we uh, just create this geometry using this builder and then I just press it and it's visualized automatically. So I just return the type and we have all those nice Jupyter plugin like he captures and says, how can we work with it? And then I can do, there is some bugs here like this one, but we uh, can actually manipulate this picture by changing, I don't know, color, making it green or turning a uh, wireframe or making something visible here. And then we can export the JSON. Oops, export button doesn't work for Jupyter for some reason. I will, I will fix it later. And we can add some things like visualize axis and et cetera, et cetera. And of course, what is important for people working with it in uh, particle physics, we can see the generated XML file. There it is. And uh, this was a toy example here, but here we have a much more interesting example because it's a real life experiment. It's a uh, IAXO detector called D0, which is uh, developed in Saragossa for IAXO um, experiment. And we have a lot of, uh, probably we should switch to properties and enable some kind of splicing. And you can see there are quite a lot of elements inside it. And we are using uh, uh, so detector here and veto system, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of things. And of course, again, what is important, we can export this geometry and use it then in our simulation. And then we can see the, the tree, uh, object tree and see different subsystems. Of course, it requires some, as you see, it requires some visual fixes right now because it requires experienced web developer here because we, it's not the problem with the program, it's problem with the CSS. Uh, I, it's very hard for me to understand it, but 
uh, the programming part is fully functional right now. So I hope I haven't bored you a lot with all those things. And uh, if you're interested, I can probably uh, share some code and uh, some more details if you like. If you're not, just please ask your questions. Yeah, thank you, Alexander, for the talk, for the interactive session. Let's see. Yeah. Um, there's some more time if if there are questions right now. Mm. Are these um, like example Jupyter notebooks available? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, I will put them. Uh, I since since I changed them a bit uh, this morning, um, I will put them on the gist, and I will then uh, give you the links to it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we can um, distribute the links here. Um, let's see if there are some questions. Um, I have a um, kind of basic question. Um, uh, can you please show the uh, notebook for the sine wave where, where it was moving? I didn't understand how it was refreshing. Like there was no explicit call for refresh. Uh, uh, it's not refreshing. Let me let me share it back a moment. It's actually not refreshing at all because it's, uh, as I said, it's working on a push model. Mm -hmm. what, what happens, uh, you see there are two artifacts here. It's a Plotly regular and Plotly server. When I start the Plotly server, I can actually restart this uh, kernel. And when I uh, start it again, I will see the message here uh, saying that I've started additional server. And here it is, and we can probably just log on to it. It's a local host, okay. uh, whatever port, port is. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I do not remember properly the path, but the mm -hmm. idea is that it uh, probably just data will do. No. Okay, uh, the thing is it generates a, a standalone server then it uh, creates a WebSocket connection to the widget here. And it pushes the small portion updates to the page. So here we have a client which consumes those updates and we have, and thus we'll, we'll have a very nice performance. As I said, there are some bugs that need to be clear because for, for example, this demonstration with a fast moving uh, sign was working perfectly fine with any delay. Uh, right now, it's not uh, that nice. Maybe because it's a uh, Jupyter kernel uses quite a sli slightly different mechanics than the uh, standalone browser version. Okay, but I, I was, I, I'm still not clear, like how how the client knows that it has to refresh. Like, uh, it's because... it's not refreshing. It's not refreshing. It's a web socket. Uh, mm -hmm. WebSocket is a two-way communication protocol. So uh, I it's connecting to this WebSocket and probably I can, mm, a moment, I can just hit it. Uh, let me just start it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second part, yeah, it's, move, it's moving slowly right now. It's okay. Yeah, pretty slowly, we can probably change it. Okay, so that, that means the third cell is also, oh, you executed that one, okay. Let, let oh, no, 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 it's fine. No, no, now it's moving in proper speed. Let us hit the, uh, this um, <laughs> debug panel, <laughs> and we will see that there is a local, here this is this connection okay. to this port, and the, my new server pushes those updates. <laughs> so it's, perfect two-way communications. By the way, the uh, Python widgets work the same way, but you, you can touch them here. You can, you, you, you can fully mm -hmm. pass information in both ways, uh, quite simple. Okay, but I, I was a bit confused when, when the number of the cell, executed cell uh, is mm -hmm. still two, uh, but uh, it somehow takes the result from the execution 
input three. Yes, right? yes, yes. Uh, it's a, the result of execution is just the uh, element in the JavaScript in the page. Mm -hmm. And it, it inside internally when I start I start this uh, element it connects to this server here and starts to get updates and actually you can do not only one plot but several plots um, maybe okay if there are no questions I can show you the desktop version of it but but uh, you can go to the plotly kit uh, and there are a lot of examples there including the dynamic servers okay thank you. I think was there a question by you, Ulrich? I saw your hand. Or do you yes. Uh, but now I forgot. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, maybe maybe you will take Nishan for the moment. I will think about my question again. <laughs> maybe it comes back. All right, Nishan. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, it comes okay, to the so age. I'll, I'll just ask the question then. <laughs> okay, so thanks for the nice talk. Um, I so I would like to uh, introduce myself. So I basically work with artificial intelligence and machine learning models. And I am kind of curious to know whether we have some or Kotlin has some uh, uh, libraries which also implements or train any machine learning models like. There you are. Uh, okay. It's a, it's a, it's a, I forgot to mention it. It's called Kotlin DL uh, deep learning. And it's also a project by JetBrains. And it's basically a Keras-like uh, framework. So mm -hmm. it's based on the TensorFlow. And I, as far as I know, uh, it implements most of the features of Python, Keras, and Kotlin. OK, but it uh, right now doesn't support PyTorch or the recent? Uh... No, it doesn't support Torch. Uh, our laboratory right now, this summer, will be the guy, uh, this Roland, uh, will be working this summer on uh, adding support uh, bindings for torch in K and K math, not mm -hmm. not for, not for the maybe for the machine learning as well. Uh, it's a different project. The Kotlin DL currently is based on TensorFlow okay. bindings because they have a nice uh, binding bindings for Java uh, for GVM. Uh, torch does not have uh, bindings, good bind bindings for GVM right now. So we will need to make them first. But yes, uh, it's going. Also, there is a Java project called um, uh, Deep Deep Learning for G. Uh, I know it's a pretty powerful, but I'm do not doing machine learning myself, so I can tell you how it is, how does it compare to um, Python systems. I think for for small things like simple model transformation uh python will be still better but if you want to develop something more complicated integrated with a different tools uh at some point you will want to do to have something more than python okay Perfect. and if, if i may may quickly add to that so deal for j is not really used by anyone anymore <laughs> so <laughs> it has become a little bit thing of the past like an but there, yeah but there's a there's a new one uh Wait, I need to ask uh, what the name was. Ah, I'm trying to move this out of my way. So there, there's something that was developed by Amazon for, for Java and deep learning, but I forgot the name I just asked and maybe uh, I, can I can tell you in a cur moment. Currently, there is a lot of uh, work being done by, for example, Facebook in terms of differential programming in Kotlin because Kotlin have a very flexible compiler and there it is possible to add new features there. And uh, they, they, they still have not published any uh, final results, but there are a lot of effort put there from the Facebook. They start, I know they, they try to do it with a Swift language, uh, some differentiable things there, but they found that the Swift is, itself is not uh, used outside iOS development. So uh, now the, all the, uh, they, they look at Kotlin for implementing that. I wanted to put the link on the chat. So it's called DJL, it's developed by Amazon. Mm -hmm. I, I I do not do I do not do uh, machine learning. We're, we're doing some uh, kind of Bayesian Bayesian analysis, yeah, yeah. Bayesian networks, but 
not not uh, machine learning so i'm not uh, yeah, i mean uh, right now our our interest is basically a mixture of bayesian optimization and machine learning so yeah maybe uh, Kotlin might not help that much right now. I'm not sure. Uh, in terms of Bayesian, uh, it's um, I, I think it's early too early to tell. But uh, in Bayesian, I think Kotlin is uh, has good prospects because in Bayesian analysis you need to work with functions. Since I'm doing a lot of Bayesian things, you need to work with functions. And as soon as you start working fu with functions in Python, you have a drop in performance like 30 times. And it's and Python does not support uh, those functions very well, but in Kotlin, since it's compiled language, just in time compiled, and it has very nice support for, for all those function operations, you can explicitly work in functions. Actually, when I do some kind of analysis, I won't fire, search for this notebook. I have it somewhere here, but. Uh, there we, you, I have usually a problem in Python because in order to work with functions in Python, I need to create a grid in NumPy, then compute the functions on these points, and it's very exhausting. Mm -hmm. And Kotlin, I just work with functions. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, my question actually came back to me now. <laughs> so um, I, I was wondering, so I originally actually come from from particle physics as well, and uh, back in back in my days, uh, not maximum systems biology. So back in my days, uh, everything was like super focused on on C and C plus plus, and sometimes some some Fortran, and maybe if you got really lucky, some old punch card somewhere in the basement. And uh, I, I I wonder what your experience is with how how reluctant people are to to touch something like like. Uh, uh, it's painful Kotlin. it's really painful because younger guys uh, younger people who have at least some experience with the modern it they are very open to new things they try to not to use c plus plus at all they uh, try to use python and then we, they want to develop something new they explore new language like meme rust julia julia is as i said it's a nice thing because it's uh, familiar to Python people and has a good interoperability with Python and uh, Scala and now Kotlin. And so I work with the people from Spain who are, uh, looked at uh, the more or less the same thing I showed you and they say, yeah, well, that's what we need. We will try to work with this language. But uh, if you take older people, they know the C++ and it's not actually C++, it's what I call C++ minus because it's uh, <laughs> uh, some kind of a C code with classes. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, it's usually, really, usually terribly designed. And the, most prob uh, the, the main problem is they take the worst part both from C and C++. They take the interoperability from C++ and C++ has zero interoperability with anything, even itself. Uh, you probably know about it. Uh, and they have a syntax and a, from C. So yeah, it's a huge problem and the, and it is hard to make people understand that they, they need better tools and they uh, they say it works and they say, yes, it works, but I, we can't maintain it. Yeah, you need uh, tens of people, for example, certain root, the uh, CERN root is not as huge, so huge. It's a similar, it's a, its size is similar to the framework I designed for Troy's new mass, but you need 20 people just to make it work, just not to break, break anything. So yes, I think the change is coming and some people tend to understand. I, and I was very surprised when um, two years ago, on the ACAD conference, uh, Rene Brun, who developed uh, the Gian, Truth, uh, Poa, all the tools, he said more or less the same things I'm saying right mm -hmm. now. So, so you, need, you need new tools, you need versatile tools, you need small projects, not those monolithic monstrosities, but the, pro the progress is slow, yes. Yeah. In in uh, so found it also quite interesting in in, in systems biology and microscopy where I'm now at home, uh, we had the issue that it, so I, I came essentially like from the C plus plus background and then I was dropped into Java and I was like yeah guys no I'm not gonna touch it with a ten foot pole, 
And I thought, okay, JVM is cool, but I don't like Java. So what am I going to do? And back then was like 2014, 2015. They were like Scala. Kotlin was just like growing. And I, I, I started touching Kotlin and I was like, man, this is super cool. This is, takes like the best of both worlds. And people back then were super skeptical. I was like, yeah, but that language is going to be dead in half a year. Nobody's going to use it. And well, it turned out differently. So that's, that's a pretty nice development. And Kotlin was super nice for us because we can easily get students in, into our projects. It's not like they have to do like <laughs> C++ template meta programming to do a serious project. They can just be dropped in and usually people find their way around in like a week. Yes, yes. It, it's a, the, so the it's a, curve, super nice. The, if you if you do not if you do not take Gradle, which is a little bit more a little complication here, and uh, I said it again, you just need to work with it, uh, spend a week learning it. Uh, the learning curve of Kotlin is similar to the Python. Yeah. Uh, there are co more complicated things like uh, type projections, uh, like uh, more esoteric parts of coroutines. But for basic things, you do in Python, you need all more or less the same time, yeah. which yeah. is exciting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned Gradle. We just switched our, our uh, build system from Maven to Gradle and we thought, okay, it's gonna be like a few weeks max. Nope, <laughs> this took us now like three months to get everything working yes, again. Yes, yes, uh, so, the, build, the, the build process is the thing you have to learn. Uh, but my favorite thing is that the Gradle problems begin when other build tools just do not get. Yeah. So if you this is this is completely true. We can do now things that in in Maven world were just impossible, right? Yeah. Just make a custom run configuration, and you you can just you know we build a run configuration to launch something on multiple machines in parallel, no problem with Gradle. Yes. Yeah. So super cool. So uh, thank you very much for the talk. I unfortunately have to leave now for the next talk, and I will shoot you an email because I I would be interested in some more technical chat. At yes, and soon. please, please register to Kotlin Slack and contact me there. Already, on... already there. Uh, there is a science channel there. Um, oh, this one I didn't see yet. I will join that. It's, cool. it's a relatively small, only like a 200 people. Uh, so there is a mathematics channel and there's science channel and there is a data science channel. So please feel free. Cool. Thank you. Well, right. Thank nice you talk and, and then uh, have a good day, right? <laughs> see you, everyone.